Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk about some books that make us feel good, books we can sink into and forget our troubles. This is the comfort reading tag. It was created by Taylor over at The Babbling Bee. I will link the original video in the description box below. I read a lot of challenging books, both in terms of the complexity of the books and the heaviness of the subject matter. So it's really nice in between picking up those types of reads to reach for books that lift my spirits or restore my faith in humanity. And I like talking about those types of books almost as much as I like reading them. So I'm very excited to look at these questions. Let's get started. Question number one is The Kettle's On, a book of steadfast comfort. It is always there for you. It makes any day better, just like a cup of tea or your favorite warm drink. I can't help but answer The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern for this one. I know that some people have problems with this book story-wise. I know they think it has a lot of flaws, but I love it in spite of any flaws that it may have, because I know that I can always turn to this book to just get completely lost in this world. And for a very logical, married to reality type of person like I am, that's not always the easiest thing for me to do. But I've read this book. I've reread it. It's actually been a while since I've reread it. I think I'm overdue for another reread of this one. But every single time, time I've read it in the past, it sucks me into the world once again. And I'm so glad that I have a book like that on my shelves that I know I can always go to when I want to be surrounded by the sights and the smells of the circus. If I want to get to be around all of these characters once again, it's nice to know that I have a book like that to turn to. Question number two, Grandmother's Quilt, a book that reminds you of a loved one or a comforting book that was given to you or read aloud by someone dear. My answer for this one is actually a more recent read. It's one that I read last year. It's a book called The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnim. I read the book and then I immediately went and watched the movie. And then I did a book versus movie comparison video on this channel shortly thereafter. I'll link that for you in the description box below and up in the cards if you'd like to see it. Spoiler alert, I loved both of them. But while I was watching the movie, which is so gentle and beautiful and dare I say comforting, I started to get the feeling that my godmother would love it if she hadn't already seen it. My godmother is the type of person who loves books and tea and beautiful flowers and Downton Abbey. Like that's just totally her vibe. And the movie just seemed like it would be her perfect kind of thing. So the next time I was on the phone with her, I asked her, have you ever seen The Enchanted April? She said, actually, that's my favorite movie ever. <laughs> I don't know how I never knew that about her. You would think I would have known that that's her favorite movie, but it definitely confirms that I really know her taste, which is awesome. So when we were talking about the movie, I told her about the book. She didn't know that the movie was based on a book. So that was a fun piece of information to share with her. And now anytime I think about the book or the movie, which is a lot because I really, really loved it and I really want to reread it, I think about her and it's just such a nice memory to have. Question number three is Warm Spices, a book with particularly vivid prose or imagery, a story comforting in its richness, depth, or vibrance. Oh, that has to be anything by the one and only Edith Wharton. Everything I've read of hers has writing that is so ornate, so melodious. I remember reading The Age of Innocence. It was my very first Edith Wharton. I was buddy reading it with Britta and we were talking over Voxer and I remember saying something along the lines of, this writing is thick and rich like icing. Mainly because of that statement, I feel like the book The Age of Innocence lives on in my mind as though it were a wedding cake. Like the book feels like the perfectly tiered wedding cake you would see on like the Great British Bake Off. Has a generous amount of icing, beautiful yet simple decorations, elegant edible flowers cascading down the side. Like that's how I think about this book. It is so beautiful that it will make you forget that it's a sad story. But really, I feel like all of Edith Wharton's books are like that. I've not read an uplifting Edith Wharton book yet, and I'm pretty 
sure none exist. I think they are all extremely depressing. But everything is so beautiful going on inside the book. Everything is so perfectly put. You just want to spend more time with her language and just let it wash over you that you forget that they're really sad stories and all of the characters end up miserable. It's enough to make you wonder at the end of an Edith Wharton book, do I like being sad? <laughs> Question number four is Candlelight, a book that keeps you going or encourages you when things feel dark. My answer for this one is Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. And this book is a great example of why I don't love making videos about my lists of favorite books. I get a lot of requests to make those types of videos. I know people like watching them, but I don't really like making them because I always feel like I'm tempting fate. Like the universe is going to introduce a new favorite into my life right after I make that video. And then the list is outdated. And that is exactly what happened with this book. I had just updated my list of nonfiction favorites. And maybe a month or two later, I realized that this book should have been on that list. In this memoir, the author talks about a period of time in her life when she just felt utterly and completely lost. She really needed a role model, someone to look up to. And so she chose this taxonomist named David Starr Jordan. She had heard a story about him trying to fight the entropy of the universe, and she thought that was really admirable. And so she started looking more into his life and discovered some not great things. That will be your journey to go on if you choose to read this book, which I highly recommend. I obviously love it. But basically what I took out of this book is that there is no control. We might think we have control, but we never do. And that can be terrifying, but there's also so much comfort in that. I think there's a sense of peace that you can achieve when you realize that there's so much in this universe outside of your control. We are all just tiny little specks within this universe, and we can only do what we can do. We can try our hardest at the things that mean something to us, but beyond that, the universe is going to universe. It's going to be chaos. There is going to be entropy, and we can only respond to it. And that's just how things are going to be. There's no one thing we can do to battle the natural way of things. And there's no one person who we can all look at and say, oh, yes, that person has all of the attributes necessary to have a full and meaningful life. It just doesn't exist. And I think it's also really important to understand that people are very flawed and they are very much products of their time. I think it's possible for us to look back at historical figures and people in our own day. I think it's possible to pull the things that we think are admirable and try to emulate those and realize that they are definitely going to have flaws. And that's part of all of us. So whenever I'm feeling really frustrated, like I really would like to have someone who I can just emulate in order to achieve all the things that I want to achieve, or when things aren't happening at the pace that I would like them to happen at, I think back to this book and to the peace that you can feel when you accept certain things about the way this universe works. So this book definitely helps me through some frustrating moments. Question number five is Laugh Medicine, a book that makes you laugh out loud or grin widely, coming to the rescue on the gloomiest days. Without question, Hyperbole in Half by Ali Brosh, there is a chapter in this book that never fails to give me the hiccups because I'm laughing so hard. I've read that chapter a number of times. I know exactly what's going to happen. And yet I laugh that hard every single time I read it, which I think is quite the accomplishment. And I also have really good memories of this book because it reminds me of my study abroad trip to Russia. One of my roommates told me about Allie's blog, and we would all just kind of circle around her laptop in the dorm rooms using what may have been the worst internet connection on earth, trying to look at these blog posts. And once they finally loaded, we would all just be laughing hysterically at them. And then I think it was a couple of years after our trip, I heard that this
this book was going to be coming out and that it was going to include some of the blog posts that I loved so much, that I loved reading in Russia with my friends so much. But then there was also going to be new stuff in here. So I'm pretty sure I pre-ordered it and read it as soon as it came out and loved it and had the reaction to that one chapter that I keep having over and over again. So it's comforting in that way and that I know it's always going to make me laugh, but also it's comforting because it reminds me of one of the most wonderful times in my life. Question number six is in bed all day. You've got your warm drink, a cozy blanket. What do you read when you're curled up in bed all day? For me, it varies pretty drastically. I'm tempted to be really realistic and boring and just say the next book I'm commissioned to review, because more often than not, that is a book that I will be curled up with. I have to prioritize those books because I have writing to do after I finish reading. But let's just focus on pleasure reading for the moment. Let's forget about my written reviews. So if I'm doing some comfort reading, I would be reading something like 84 Charing Cross Road, one of my nonfiction favorites. I could reread that book an infinite number of times and not get tired of it. I love it so much. But also maybe I'd be curled up with a good romance book. So if I pick up something like one of the books in the Well Met trilogy by Jen DeLuca, the Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood, which I really enjoyed, or Evie Drake Starts Over by Linda Holmes, which I still think about. I read it and reviewed it here on the channel earlier this year. It gives me the opportunity to tune out the noise of the world for a little while and just let my heart flutter. And for someone like me who feels like I'm part robot and I read these really heavy things, it feels like such an indulgence. And sometimes it's just exactly what I need. Question number seven is Endless Comforts, a book that brings you solace no matter how many times you reread it. Anyone who knows me knows exactly how I'm going to answer this question. I have one favorite book, one all-time favorite book. I reread it every single June. I've read it seven times now. Next year will be my eighth time reading it, and it never fails to pick me up. It's Rules of Civility by Amor Tolls. I have to say, though, I don't pick this book up every single year just because it's comforting. I mean, that's an element in my enjoyment of it year after year, the familiarity of it, the predictability of knowing what's going to happen. That's nice. And it does put me in a great mood. But I pick this book up every single year because I get something new out of it every single year. So like when I read it just in June, even after six previous readings, Reads, I got new things out of it because I'm at a different place in my life every single year. So I've reread it from my mid 20s now into my early 30s. It means something different to me every single year. And I love that about this book. I love rereading this book for so many reasons. But the primary reason these days is that I know what rereading the book does for me. I know what kind of headspace it puts me in. Like I am in such a good place when ever I read this book. It's one of the reasons why when I'm going through a rough time, I just want to pick up this book because I know where it puts me mentally. It's like when I'm rereading rules, nothing bothers me. If I have rough days, if life is continuing to throw things at me, it doesn't matter. It's like I have this aura, this bubble around me where just nothing can touch me because I'm rereading this book that means so much to me. It's like in the musical Crazy for You where Bobby Child sings, I'm dancing and I can't be bothered now. Well, when I'm rereading this book, it's like I'm rereading rules and I can't be bothered now. I'm going to have that song stuck in my head now. Question number eight is Portable Hope, a book that restores your faith in humanity, faith in life, faith in yourself, a book that says it's going to be okay. The world is full of good things and tomorrow will be better. Definitely Saving Jemima by Julie Zickfus. This book is about a wildlife rehabilitator named Julie Zickfus who takes in an orphaned baby blue jay named Jemima and cares for her as she's getting ready to release her back into the wilds. And during this period of time, Jemima really becomes a part of the family and helps Julie overcome a lot of things that were going on in her life at the time. It really is just the most 
heartwarming book. I read so much about environmental destruction and degradation. So to get the opportunity to read about this woman caring for this bird, making a difference in such a small but necessary way, it was just exactly what I needed at the time. I reviewed this book for Open Letters. It's a gushy review, as you could probably guess. I will link it for you down below if you'd like to read it. And a cool thing about this book, beyond just the fact that I loved it and that I wrote about it, is that I know Julie Zickfoofs read that review because she took the time to email us about it and thank us for posting that review. And she also posted the review on her Facebook, which got it so much love. So many people were saying such nice things about the review and my writing, which was just wonderful. I'm sure it was also really nice for Julie to know that someone out there loved her book as much as I loved it. I also really love following her on Instagram. I love seeing what's going on in her daily life. Her kids seem amazing. She has the most adorable dog. I love seeing her rescue even more birds. I just have all around good feelings when it comes to this book. Question number nine is a basket for your neighbor. Imagining you were putting together a cozy comfort basket for your neighbor or a friend or a loved one, what book or books would you include? Well, before I put together any basket, I would want to have a good long think about the person I was putting it together for. I really like to personalize my gifts that I give to people. And so any basket I give to any single person would be very specific to what they like. I would never do a one size fits all type of basket. I love giving gifts and I put a lot of thought into them. So for my husband, it would be a sci-fi fantasy basket. And I would definitely need to do some research ahead of time, do some poking around the SFF corners of booktube to get some ideas of what to get him because that's not really my sphere. And then for my mom, I keep an ongoing list of World War II history or historical fiction titles that I hear about. I keep them all on one list. So I always have ideas of what to get her because that's very much what she likes to read about. And I would also get her a book of cryptograms, these puzzles that she likes to do. It's actually a yearly tradition that we have that I get her one of those books for Christmas. For my sister, her basket would be full of YA books. Even though she's older than me, she has a very busy life and she really likes binging through YA books. She and I did a whole video together in which we talked about that concept. I will link it for you in the description box and up in the cards if you'd like to see us talking about that. But for her, she hates waiting for the next book to come out in a series. So I'd want her basket to include one finished YA series so that she could just binge through all the books. She really likes doing that. And then for my best friend, I'd include some legal thrillers, some mysteries, and and then some beach reads. And then in everybody's baskets, I'd have other goodies in there as well. So maybe some baked goods, preferably ones that I have baked. And then of course, some candles from North Avenue Candles where I work. And the last question, question number 10 is a walk in the woods. Talk about a book with beautiful nature writing or a book that restores your peace. This is my kind of question. If you've spent any time on this channel, then you'll know how much I love nature writing. I was very excited to see this question, although it's very challenging to pick just one. There are so many good nature writing books out there. But I decided for this question to go with Late Migrations by Margaret Rankel. Not only is there a lot of beautiful nature writing in here that really brings the American South of the author's childhood to life, she also writes in this really calming, composed, serene, if slightly melancholy way. And I remember just being so comforted by this book when I read it last spring. And I think that makes it the perfect book to close out this tag with. So that was the comfort reading tag. Thank you so much to Taylor for creating this tag. These questions were delightful to answer. I had so much fun. I am going to tag a few people in the description box below. But if you want to do this tag and your name isn't down there, please 
feel free to do it anyway. You can even say that I tagged you. I would love to see more people do this tag and talk about comforting books. It's exactly the kind of cozy content that I am looking for. If you have any comments or questions about anything you've seen in this video or about anything in general, please feel free to leave those in the comment section below. And if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on a variety of places around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram. The links to everywhere you can find me will be at the bottom of the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.